Well, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. John Hanna as our speaker in chapel today. Dr. Hanna has enjoyed a distinguished career of more than 40 years at DTS. He is the Distinguished Professor of Historical Theology and the Research Professor of Theological Studies. He's also a frequent and popular church and conference speaker both at home and abroad. His teaching interests include the general history of the church, with particular interest in the works of Jonathan Edwards and John Owen. Among his published works are a history of DTS and a general history of the Christian church. He remains active in church ministries and serves on the boards of several organizations. He is married to Carolyn, who is here today. Carolyn, where, where are you? Oh, over here, okay. Good to see you, and we welcome you today as well. They have two grown daughters and six grandchildren, including a set of triplets. Amen. Amen. I first met Dr. Hannah before I was a student, just before I was a student, in Austin, Texas, at a McDonald's. I recognized him, and so I worked up the courage to go up and introduce myself to him. I'd been eating french fries, and um, I introduced myself, and when I did, a french fry catapulted itself <laughs> from my mouth to his sweater, <laughs> and it stuck. <laughs> he looked down at his sweater, and he looked at me, and he put out his hand and said, nice to meet you. <laughs> this is a great man speaking to us today. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. John Hanna to our chapel today? Thank you. Um, the topic today, in terms of title, is looking back, seeking guidance for tomorrow, the Dallas Theological Seminary at 100. Unveiling the structure of the past is a precarious endeavor due to the lapse, lapse of time between object and interpreter. The bias of prejudice, both in recording and interpreting data, the haunting realization of silence, the foreboding incompleteness of archival materials. I will nonetheless endeavor to walk the path with you for a few minutes. We find our school at a remarkable moment we are celebrating this year 100 years of the directive grace, multitudinous mercies, and unbelievable impact to our students that began with 12 and now spans the globe with thousands of men and women seeking to proclaim the person and accomplishments of the one who loved us and purchased us in his blood. As I reflect on our institution from a physical perspective, the beautiful campus, the buildings that now stretch several, bl several blocks, the state-of-art classrooms, a brilliant faculty of the fading old and the emerging new. I can only stand in awe of the privileges that God has so graciously poured out upon us. I want to propose a question. It is this. What has been the distinguishing feature of our school that may indeed be the observable phenomena of our longevity. I offer to you today a thesis with a cluster of secondary yet vital factors, though they can be cited even indebted as to sequential importance. I come with the theory that the Dallas Theological Seminary was born and has been perpetuated by the passion of our founder, Lewisbury Chafer. His unrelenting convictions shaped to some degree by the social and religious vicissitudes of his era, the 20th century witnessing to the harbinger of the dissolution of traditional epistemology, philosophical and cultural assumptions, as well as values. Yet far more than that was the experience garnered through the shaping of mercies in the years of his life prior to the founding 
of our institution. I am not so much interested today in the biographical framework of his life, though that is unavoidable since ideas and experience are inseparable, as I am in those various factors that shaped his passion for the work of God, that he wove into the fabric of his life, and that to us today as an institution. To get to all of that, um, show you some pictures. This is Dr. Lewis Berry Schaefer, uh, born 1871, passed into the presence of the eternal being in 1952. <sighs> I'm in trouble already. Ah, oh, that, that's okay, life goes on. Um, <laughs> his father uh, was Thomas Franklin Schaefer. Um, a young man born just south of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, immigrant family of 1837, um, interesting man. He attended uh, various schools and graduated from Auburn University, Auburn Theological Seminary on May 1, 1865. He married a young lady, an orphan, uh, by the name of Lomira, out of Ellington, New York, they formed a family. His dad was a congregational minister of the gospel and did extensive church planting uh, because he thought that uh, the warmth of the frontier might help him with uh, emerging tuberculosis that would take his life when Dr. Chafer was a 10-year-old lad. <sighs> Dr. Chafer was born in this home, Rock Creek, Ashtabula County, Ohio. His dad was then a missionary out on the frontier in Kansas, Wellington, Kansas, south of Wichita. Uh, Dr. Chafer records in his diary that he had a son born but he didn't see that son for a year. Until his missionary stint was over, he returned to Rock Creek where he, the church was vacant pastorally and he assumed that office and pastored. So for the last nine years of Thomas Franklin Schaefer, he, he was a pastor. Smithfield, Pennsylvania, Rock Creek twice. Um, they had three children. Uh, Rollin was born in 1868. Uh, Marietta was born in 1869. And uh, Lewis came along in 1871. Here's the lad. Oh, I should do it this way. Uh, cute little kid, one would say. Um, raised in the home of a godly mom and dad who had a passion for the gospel and a passion for the Lord's church that go together. And so at a tender age, I think about 10, he was led to the Lord by his dad and mom in uh, Smithfield, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Chafer, they wrote for him in the book, God so loved Lewisbury Chafer that he gave his only begotten son. Isn't that pretty? That will shape the man beyond compare. With a father now in heaven, Lomira had the burden of caring for her family. She did a lot of variety of hard work, but she wanted to ensure that her sons and daughter were properly educated. A man that touched the life of Thomas, Lomira wanted to touch their kids' lives. And so they went to a proprietary college called New Lyme Institute. There, uh, he was trained under a man, Jacob Tuckerman, principal of the school, that uh, they hoped would influence their children. 
from New Lyme Institute. Uh, Dr. Chafer now, a 19, 18-year-old lad, uh, attended um, Oberlin College, actually Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Um, in the home, their house was filled with music. Uh, Rollin played the violin, Marietta, uh, a pianist, and uh, Dr. Chafer, the cornet. It, it was that kind of a world. I want to create that world. And so for a year or two years, this would be 1889 to about 90, 90, 91, he uh, studies music. <sighs> when he finished at Oberlin, he joined an evangelist. His name was Arthur T. Reed. He was a local evangelist in Ohio. Uh, and so Dr. Chafer spent most of the 1890s <laughs> um, putting up a tent, taking down a tent, collecting the hymnals, etc., etc., and singing. He's a musician. In 1896, he met his dear wife, Lorraine, and they became a team, an evangelistic team together. Separated from A.T. Reed, uh, Dr. A.T. Reed performed their wedding ceremony in Painesville, Ohio, and uh, the couple went off into evangelism. Chafer would preach, uh, Lorraine, Ella, would uh, play the piano. Very accomplished family. But his passion, his passion is... God gave. In 1899, his world changed because in that year, he attended the conference at Northfield Bible Conference of D.L. Moody, the year Mr. Moody died. And it changed him in this way. You can see that his world is expanding and his passion with it. And what he does is that he hears speakers, England, Australia, New Zealand, coming into this great Bible conference, and, and his world just blossoms. He is ordained unto the gospel ministry as a congregationalist in 1900. Uh, you can see his movement. He... Um, enters the Presbyterian Church in 1906 as a cleric, will die with that ordination. He will meet a man that will deeply shape his life. In fact, he will say, he, he sat in a little Bible institute. So you can see the man changing from uh, evangelistic work with a passion, but a growing educational sense in his mind, but it takes years. It's slow. But he hears these great conference speakers. He buys a home at Northfield, so in the off-season of evangelistic witness, he became a leader at the Northfield conferences. In those great conferences, Lorraine was the pianist. And you can only imagine the array of people that are now forgotten. He purchased the home of A.T. Pearson. A.T. Pearson was giving up his home because Charles Haddon Spurgeon had died and he was to assume had, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's pulpit. But he sits and he listens and he hears this man. And he says that in hearing him teach one class, it, it changed his life. It reoriented him. He heard things he had not been privy to before. As is, uh, he teaches. Uh, he teaches music. His first book is a book of musical scores. He teaches young men, uh, and, and they ask him questions like, 
Oh, this is my favorite picture, horse and buggy. Remember, Ford isn't around. Um, they ask him, why don't you teach us? And he, he just sort of lodged it in the back of his mind. But they sowed the seed. The seed grew in, when he met W.H. Griffith Thomas, retired Anglican from Wycliffe Hall College, Toronto, Canada, retired in Philadelphia. And he met this man, Anderson, William M. Anderson, Jr., who pastored the First Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Texas. The, these, these friendships. Uh, Chafer by then had moved to East Orange, New Jersey, became associated as a traveling itinerant with C.I. Schofield. He wrote the curriculum for what became uh, Karen's University, Philadelphia College of Bible, Philadelphia Bible Institute in 1913. He taught in the night school, called the New York Night School, with Dr. Schofield and traveled broadly, meeting people, cementing relationships, and then, uh, as well as, uh, I should say, A.B. Winchester, pastor of Portland, Oregon. Three of them met in 1922 in a hotel in Atlanta, Georgia. His mind is moving. And he met there with W.H. Griffith Thomas, A.B. Winchester, and they laid out the plans for a new school, a different school. So this man, this man was first an evangelist. This man understood the grace of God. But slowly and slowly, by invisible forces that shapes each of our lives, you can see him change without changing. So in 1924, officially, legally, 1925, the Evangelical Theological College was born, named uh, an attachment given by W. H. Griffith Thomas. It would be placed in Dallas because of the influence of William M. Anderson, Jr. Our first campus uh, was 513 to 520 Hugh Circle. It was a rented facility that simply housed the original 12 that were the original student body. Chafer's dream is to grow the school to 100, trained for the gospel. The first class composed 12, some say 13. We had a renegade from Oklahoma, I can't chase down. But hopefully he returned, increasing the IQ in both states. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> don't, don't, I should, I'm trying to be absolutely serious. Uh, and so, uh, the, the faculty is sitting with Dr. Chafer, um, William Grill, these names you may not know, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio Nunez formed the first faculty. But by 1828, two years later, the dormitory was not sufficient. Classrooms were held at first press. First graduation was at first press. And so through a lady by the name of Mrs. Wilson, there's always a Mrs. Wilson in everybody's career. <laughs> She's silent, but without her, it would not be. So our second home became 3909 Swiss Avenue. It became a mansion, a home, built in 1879 uh, by William Gaston. It was called the Gaston Estate. And that became our home uh, until it would eventually be torn down and uh, our buildings would begin to come. 
Our buildings were two originally. In 1928, oops, let's go forward. In 1928, Stearns Hall was a dormitory at that time. Uh, our, and that was 28, named for Daniel Stearns, a Bible teacher. And in 1931, Davidson, named for a board member's mother, Lady Davidson. Okay. Uh, no other buildings until 1963. Um, we went through the Depression, we went through a war, uh, and that, that became our campus. When I walked on it uh, in 1967, it looked like this. Stearns, and, and the reason for the big green between the end of Stearns and Swiss is that's, that's where the mansion sat, the old mansion that was. Termites were holding hands for us so we could have it. Okay. Um, and then Davidson, and then uh, Mosier Library. And behind that, in the year of uh, Dr. Chafer's death, uh, he dedicated what would become Chafer Chapel, and that was our school. Now, so I think, when I think of him, at the heart of this man, was a passion to carry the gospel to the ends of the world. He prayed that one whole class would go to the mission field. Uh, naivety, but it's also called passion and vision. I come now to the great question. This is all prefatory. What was the passion of our founder that shaped our school? If valid, our tomorrows. I'm not talking about methods that structure the daily operation of our school, nor the specific content of our various courses culminating in various certification programs. Times will bring change. Structures change with time. The perception of value is time-dependent. I am concerned for what cannot change. What assumptions must remain? Not merely mentioned in our literature, our classrooms, the out of each of us. Structure is not our givens. They are methods of facilitation. What did Dr. Chafer give us that if deprioritized, not eliminated, would alter the school born of his vision. Here we go. I think it all began in the context of a nurturing home where Thomas and Lomira taught their sons and daughter about the person and claims of one that had changed their lives. This seems such a given that it appears odd to speak of it. However, we must never forget that our origins are in heaven, that the real work we do is invisibly wrought by the power of heaven itself. The story of John 3.16 that God gave is our passion, our commission, and that's our message. It's not about personality. The functional structure of this passion took shape through several decades as he encountered various people and events. His mom and dad, Jacob Tuckerman, his teacher, who discipled his dad A.T. Reed, the evangelist. The Northfield Bible Conferences. C.I. Schofield. First, as evidenced by almost a, dec a decade as an evangelist assistant, and later joining with Lorraine as a team, 
and instilled passion for the souls of men, women, and boys and girls only deepened. Since through the summer Northfield conference speakers while teaching music at Mount Hermon School for the Boys, a proprietary college, in, his, in the field of his training, his focus gradually shifted to Bible teaching with an increasing institutional emphasis. New York Knight School of the Bible, Philadelphia College of Bible, or Cairns University. He traveled extensively with Schofield in Bible conference ministry, where his focus narrowed to the spiritual life. So I'm putting things together. A passion for people. A, pa a passion to train people with a passion for people. And a slow shift to another form of multiplication. Hearing Schofield, numerous Bible teachers at the annual conferences brought change in his perspective. The evangelist was becoming a teacher, skilled teacher. As the second decade of the last century edged away, a further shift became evident, an emerging vision to train others at the highest level incorporating the distinctives of the Bible conference movement within a postgraduate ministerial curriculum, what he would call a new departure in education. Focusing on the Bible, not about it, but what it says. A curriculum, the Holy Scriptures. This book is the book of life. It reveals the realities of a world of beauty beyond the grasp of mortals, of a condescending infinite one who alone has the capacity to lift the finite to the realms of the infinite. A heart devotion to the Lord Jesus was fundamental simply because our work is about him. We know him as we grow in knowledge, theoretical, practical, and experiential. Through the book, indented by the Spirit of God, that is the content of our ministries, Chafer firmly believed that the work of God through us was accomplished by the Spirit of God. Finitude, however, powerful does not equal infinitude. It's that simple. He meant that the preparation of servants was more than merely the accumulation of information and techniques. Your character will be long remembered after your sermons are forgotten. By this he meant the modeling of Christian character, the fruit of the Spirit by a caring faculty. His vision embraced the notion that the love of God has been revealed in God's incarnate Son, that God is love, that Jesus is the love of God revealed to us and purchased for us, and the Holy Spirit indwelling each of us is the love of God possessed to be given away. He wanted each of his students to walk in true biblical love, meaning lives filled with and manifesting forth the love of God. What was his vision? for the school. That he worked so hard to create. I think it's three things. An institution that nourishes and equips God called blood-bought people to carry the gospel of divine grace to a needy world. That's what we are. We can put on airs, but that's really who we are. An institution firmly and unhesitatingly 
committed to the centrality of the Holy Scriptures in the preparation of godly servants. Third, an institution firmly and unhesitatingly that embraces the notion that it is the Spirit of God alone who is capable of bringing life out of death, peace out of turmoil, and the kingdom where pain, sorrow, and death will be forever replaced by an adoring, worshipful people. A world beyond our conceptualization. All we have is this world to compare it to. Where the love of God will have no end and our love for him will have no diminution. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you, our sovereign Lord, thanking you for the wonder of your condescension to each of us. Paths perhaps different, but you invaded our space and you revealed to us your beauty. And we have fallen in love with you. Dallas Seminary was born out of the love of God through Christ applied by the Spirit who possesses us. May that characterize, Father, our preparation for the work and the work itself. May our ministry be a love relationship to you. And unto that end, our Father, we can only ask for your mercy to guide us and for our institution that it may forever prioritize the priorities and organize structure to accomplish it. Unto that end, our Father, we give you praise. For we have, we express this in your unmatched name of your Son, our Lord, who is the Christ, whose name is Jesus, for which we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.